it was a sort of reasonably complex music, so it was quite difficult to find the people that would like us, in a way. A lot of people come to want to hear rock and roll, we weren't right, we weren't blues, we weren't all these kind of things. We, we weren't too sure about it because it distracted, it appeared to distract from the music. The most ambitious tour we did was the Landmarks Down on Broadway show, and we obviously had this one costume, the Slipper Man costume, which Pete couldn't actually get a microphone anywhere near his mouth. So, it was kind of a bit strange that so you couldn't sing it, really, or not properly, anyhow. But, um, and so I think we felt at that point, you know, that you went too far. We felt that the, that the visuals had kind of slightly taken over from the music a bit on that. We knew he had a good voice, because he used to do a lot of doubling with Pete, um, which was always one of the reasons we gave that when Pete left and Phil carried on singing without him, that it didn't sound so much different as you might have thought it would. It sort of like expanded our audience to a slightly different area of people, most noticeably women, I think, actually. His main pleasure was music, for, you know, and to play it, really. He didn't kind of relax doing that many other things. As soon as we stopped doing something, he'd be off doing a session somewhere. That's when he started writing on his own, and he was able to express feelings through lyrics and stuff, which I think helped him quite a bit. You've been that popular and the man of the moment, as some artists are for an album or a year, and he was for 10, 12 years. It has to turn a little bit, you know what I mean? It, it can't last. And the brother strikes to and the trouble is, it would be Phil, too. If it was him, he wouldn't give a damn. He didn't read the papers. He doesn't read bad reviews. But Phil reads the papers, he reads reviews, he worries about things. It, it, it hurts him here, sort of thing. Before Phil joined, we, we uh, set out originally to be songwriters, uh, the original four-piece, and with a, a changing array of drummers, um, which was obviously Mike and I, with Anthony Phillips and Peter Gabriel. And, um, and we tried to sort of, having to find that no one was prepared to record our songs, that the only way we could do it was to record them ourselves. And so we, we started off by doing that in about 1970. And after doing that for a few months, um, our guitarist at the time, Anthony Phillips, decided he couldn't take it any longer. And so at that point, we decided to re restructure the band, get a new drummer and everything. And that's when we auditioned for Phil. We auditioned for Phil at Peter Gabriel's house. Um, his parents' house, and then Phil came down with uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Carroll, who's now playing with Phil again, actually. They were old mates, and uh, <coughs> I know after that, when they were driving away, I remember Ronnie, apparently the story goes, Ronnie says to Phil, cool, well, you do that one, mate. I got the gig and you haven't. And it turned out that Phil got it and Ronnie hadn't. It was a summer's day, I remember it, and I thought I was in a pair of swimming trunks, I think. But I don't remember. Could be swimming trunks and a dressing gown. Um, but it was a very, I mean, I, I must admit, if I was going for an audition at that stage in a band and I went to someone's house, parents' house, like that, I think it was a lovely sort of farm in the country near Woking and hanging out by the swimming pool, I'm sure he thought it was going to be a really nice, easy-going band. And then as soon as he joined, we went on the road in the back of the van for the next five years. So it wasn't quite how we saw it, I don't think. A lot of tapes were sent in and we'd listen to people who thought might be suitable. And, um, we, you know, the thing about... We never really thought about Phil for lots of reasons. One was we weren't sure his, his voice could cope with the range that we required. But most important of all, I didn't think he'd want to do it because it changes your life and we knew that. The one thing he wasn't was pushing for it. I didn't feel that, you know what I mean? I think the, the doubts we had, he had the same doubts too, you know what I mean? And his voice was always at that time quite pure. And as Tony said, you weren't sure he could find that kind of rough edge that Peter had and some of the songs needed. Um, as it turned out, within a couple of years, hammering around the world, <laughs> around the world, he soon got it, didn't he? He did indeed, yes. uh, And a very good sort of rough edge, too. I remember the first gig very well, actually, because I remember looking up here. Playing where was it? Was, it was London, Ontario, wasn't it? Yeah, I see. Um, at least that's what I've read. No, I was playing, you know, you playing, I was so used to looking up and seeing Pete, you know, and, that, and I was playing, looking up and see Phil, and for a start, as you know, he's a lot shorter. <laughs> and, uh, and he was wearing, I think he was wearing some sort of a Hawaiian shirt or something, wasn't he? It's my, my memory, anyhow. Oh, really, so. And um, it just looked very unlikely. And I thought the first song I thought, oh, God, this is, this is weird. This, this, I don't know about this at all. And then I could just see the way, when he was talking to the audience, the way they responded. And they, you know, when they laughed at his jokes, <laughs> they kind of laughed with a kind of warmth. And I felt what I realised at that point was the audience really wanted to like him. I remember seeing Phil after the first song, and he had a little bit of paper with his, what was going to say, or outline on a bit of paper. And I saw this hand, right? And it, the white paper was shaking like this, you know, for the first introduction. And then by the time the second one came, or the third one came, it kind of, his hand um, steadied. So I thought, we're going to be OK then. I think 
when Phil came in, it started to write a little bit more, which happened on, on the album Duke. What was good, really, was just the, the, the change, change just by having a third person, kind of, it, it changed everything a little bit. And I think he introduced a slightly different element, a slightly more direct approach at times, which we could either use on its own or else kind of incorporate in, in one of the more complicated kind of songs. Uh, as well as always still being a great drummer and being able to influence a lot in that way. I think what happened more was his confidence grew and he was able to contribute more to the band. Um, prior to that, I think he was a little bit sort of hesitant about putting forward his own ideas. And no doubt having success on his own obviously meant that he felt more confident about his own writing, which is a very important thing. And I think one of the most significant things that occurred during that period was, was his writing as a lyricist. Um, and, you know, whereas before his lyrics, earlier lyrics were not, not the greatest. Once he sort of found a kind of way to write, he sort of could write really good lyrics, I think, on so many subjects. He liked to stay in the real, real world, whereas we'd sort of worked in the fantasy land a bit more before that. And I think that was a great contribution, really, a great change um, that sort of occurred, you know, and, and he was able to kind of write in a way that sounded very natural. I reckon the reason we've survived so long, or did survive so long, really, was because we never had a master plan, like, do this, do that. Our manager did it, but we just sort of did it one album at a time, really, I think, and reconvened from the next one. So when something like, like Phil's um, problems with his relationship and his marriage and his family came along and he, he wanted to move to Canada for a long period of time, <clears throat> I think we just sort of, you go with the flow a little bit. You know what I mean? He gave us more time to start doing some, time some solo sort stuff we sort of started. So that was kind of fine. I think we've always been, as a band, in a funny way, quite adaptable, I think. You know, I think obviously he took great solace in sort of in, in, in the music, you know, and he's, that's when he started writing on his own and he was able to express, you know, feelings through, through the lyrics and stuff, which I think helped him quite a bit. But, you know, there's no doubt that he was, uh, you know, he was having some tough times. But when he's with us a lot of the time, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, what blokes like when they're together, you know, they don't necessarily talk about these things very much, so you kind of carry, carry through. And I think the music obviously was a big distraction, which was, was, was a very important part of his life. If I remember rightly, we were in the middle of Abacab. We were in the middle of the album when uh, the band album and his thing came, came out. And I remember the, the single going to number four, I think, in the first week, and it was fantastic. Um, I don't know, it sounds odd to say now, but we still seem a bit removed from it, funny enough. OK, he was, had to go and do some stuff, but until the album was finished, he was pretty much locked in by a bit of promo and stuff um, to making the album. It wasn't until the album was finished, really, that... that um, he kind of went mad, and then the next few years it sort of went, it went that way. So I think over the next year, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think when we came out to the next album, I, it occurred to me after the huge success of Face Value, you might not want to do it, which I would have understood, you know what I mean? He got a fantastic solo career. Um, but somehow, people never seem to understand it, really. We seem to get back together again each time after his sort of huge solo success. And it kind of felt the same. I mean, I know it sounds a bit odd to say, and people never believe me, I'm sure, when I say that, but it did feel, it didn't change anything, really. We were the same sort of guys. It didn't come in any different, a bit like, I've had a lot of success, guys. I'm in charge. You know, it didn't, it didn't change the balance that we had as three individual guys together. I think, as I said before, really, what tended to happen, I think, to a large extent, was that the, the group became more, more even. The three of us sort of, you know, equal partners, as it were. Because no doubt that when... Phil originally took, took over the, the vocals. He, he was slightly the junior party because he'd sort of joined later. I know it seems ridiculous, only about a year or two after the band had formed, but that's, it still felt like that. I think it felt like that to him. And, uh, and I think that made it, made it much easier. And we all had our strengths as well. I mean, Phil definitely is quite strong sort of with sound ideas and things, you know. So you'd kind of, each person would, you know, would dominate in the area that which they were best at, I felt. And obviously you'd have areas we should share, you know, like lyrics and, and the writing of the music and stuff. Um, so it, it, it worked out really well, I think, and I, I think some of those albums, I mean, particularly for me, uh, Making Invisible Touch and, and We Can't Dance was some of the most fun we ever had. I mean, talking about Phil's aspect of the touring, I think he found touring with Genesis actually quite, a, quite difficult, in fact. I think that the, um, I mean, the sort of fun we had was much more in the studio and everything. I think on the road, he got to the stage where he was getting so worried about his voice all the time, protecting it. And he knew that if a show was cancelled, you know, what it meant, the number of people it would affect and everything. And, uh, you know, he had all these sort of compromised vocal lines we could, he could do to try and save his voice a bit. And it was a bit like sometimes every morning you, when you'd see him, sort of, how's your voice felt? And, sort of, <coughs> and you sort of virtually no voice and you think, is he going to be able to sing tonight or not? And I think, I think he felt that was quite a pressure. Well, that kind of pressure, 
being to do with the voice when you're on tour. I mean, I think that's horrible. I think it's really hard. Um, it ruins the day. <laughs> if you're the singer's whole, really, you're on tour. There's 300 blokes and lorries and crew and technicians. They're building stages. There's 7,000 people about to walk in the stadium, you know what I mean? And you're going, ah, trying to clear your voice. There's no voice there at all, you know? And inside, I'm sure he's wanting to say, listen, guys, I haven't got hope in hell of doing it. Outside, he's sort of trying to say, well, I'll give it a try. You know, so it must be a horrible sort of conflict of, 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 of trying to balance the two. That, that is hard, I think, and it does, that did spoil some of the, t the aspect, I think, it's fulfilled especially, because, you know, on nights off, we were kind of carefree, had a good old time, and he had to sort of go to bed early a lot, you know, and, and worry about his voice. No, he used to, no, no, he'd, he'd listen to the tapes. Um, we all did a bit, but he used to listen to them a lot more than I did. No, obviously, we'd hear the tape, no, no point in listening without making notes about comments about how to make things better. And I'm sure that the little note would go under the sound man's door. Um, and that, which, is, which is fine, you know what I mean? That's because that, that's what you do. Um, I never got a note under my door, I didn't think about that. Uh, no. I think he knows what would have happened if he'd done that. <laughs> We're on tour in Japan. I go to the Roland factory, because I'm, I'm into gear and stuff and heard about these drum machines. And I go to the little house in the middle of, in the middle of Tokyo. And I buy these three drum machines, like numbers sort of four, five, and six. I mean, they're, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm cutting edge here. You know? I come back to the hotel, and I'm so excited. And I say, I bought one for you, Tony, one for you, Phil. Um, but pay me for them, pay me back. Um, and he was like, oh, OK. And Phil was basically saying, I'm a drummer. I'm not sure why do I want this. And I was so upset with the lack of reaction. I really thought I'd been cutting edge, got these three machines. They're going to be great. And I got a bit of a sort of, oh, all right. Then. Um, but as you know, I mean, Phil was the first one to really use them uh, to the best advantage, and they became a big part of our our life. He did indeed. There you go. Yeah. He probably Salome for it actually. <laughs> probably. So does Phil probably <laughs> Salome for the yeah. machine. But I mean, I look back over, uh, especially the eighties, which was a turn a very busy time, but but uh, it was a great time for us really. I don't know, we just seem to have an awful lot of laughter. I mean, you get three, one thing I miss really now, out of all the things, now that we're not with Phil anymore, you miss the touring, you miss the writing, but you kind of miss the kind of hanging out. We used to have, I mean, we used to have an amazing, you know, we just, you know, when you're just laughing your head off and you can't stop. We sort of had a thing, we kind of vibe each other up when we were together. Um, and um, you kind of miss that. I kind of miss that almost most of all.